So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us um, and joining us to, for the next step of our unnatural gas campaign. My name is Melissa Lem. I'm a family doctor um, in Vancouver, which is um, the, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations on this day after the autumn equinox. And as we enjoy this season's harvest, I want to express my gratitude for the Indigenous peoples across the province who have protected and stewarded these lands and and waters since time immemorial and continue to do so. So again, welcome. Um, this is the next step after our unnatural gas campaign where we launched with the billboards and with um, and with our open letter to the MLAs and Premier Horgan. And now we're training, we're, the purpose of this is to give you some background about natural gas and fracking within BC and their health risks and also kind of train people up on how to meet their MLAs. So thank you so much. Um, the first half of the webinar will um, be will be uh, led by our amazing CAPE Executive Director, Do Dr. Anjali Helferty, and then the second second half will be giving you some background information about the local and global health risks of fracked natural gas. And I'm actually going to put some links into the chat um, that are quite relevant to this meeting. So the first one is. Um, a link to the sign up sheet to lead an MO to lead an MOE meeting. So there are already some names on there. And if you just kind of look for your um, your writing and enter your name there if you're interested in, in scheduling it, so that would be great. The second link is to the MLA meeting toolkit, which um, which Dr. Kevin Liang was wonderfully put together. And so that just gives you all the information you need, um, kind of a summary of what Anjali is talking about today about scheduling a meeting and conducting it in an effective way. And the third link is our unnatural gas briefing note, which we recommend that you leave behind with your MLA after the meeting and just read it for background also. All right. Um, so, and then one more housekeeping thing is that we're, we're planning to save the Q&A, um, the Q&A is to two parts. So the first part will be after, um, at the end of Anjali's session, where she talks about how to meet your MLA. And the second one um, will be after we deliver sort of background information about fracking and LNG and health. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce CAPE's Executive Director, Dr. Anjali Helferty, to talk to us about how to meet our MLAs. Great. Thanks very much, Melissa. And um, I'm curious first to start with, I will have some slides to share um, over the next short while, but um, I think either through, since most folks have their video off, either through, you know, the hand raise um, emoticon in your, uh, in within Zoom, or you could put a little yes or a star in the chat or turn on your video if you like and raise your hand. Um, who has had a meeting with an elected official before, before today? Yep. A good, a good number, lots actually. So I think we'll hopefully draw on all of your experiences today. Um, but I'm curious if one or two people wanna quickly share you don't have to turn on video, video, you can just unmute if you like, um, you know, 30 seconds or a minute about your experience meeting with an elected official. How did it go? How did you set it up? Is anyone, I might just see who still has their hand up and and ask you to share, but, um, but would anyone like to volunteer? Sure, I'll volunteer. Terrific, um, thank you. Actually, um, so I, I met with my MP actually uh, a couple of weeks ago um, about the election. It's the first time I've done it, and um, and yeah, it was it was really great. She was very um, accommodating and um, really interested in talking about climate change, and um, and she she basically said that she wished more people would would talk to their MLAs and their MPs about issues because can hear from the public. That's great. Um, did you have a sense going in that you felt like it would be a friendly meeting? I didn't really Probably know. Not sure. Didn't know? Yeah. Um, it's always nice when it goes that way. Sorry, I think I cut you off. What were you saying? Oh, no, it's great to do things like this to help people feel more comfortable. Yeah, and Marion? So I've had um, two experiences about two, three years ago. 
maybe three years ago, I um, made an appointment to speak to my MLA, who's uh, um, the trade minister for the province about climate change. And um, he said he didn't know much about it. And um, I was the only one. And I just talked for about half an hour and I don't, you know, left him some material and I really didn't feel, I didn't follow up and I kind of felt like I did a monologue. And then, um, <laughs> and then on um, July 29th, uh, Canada on Fire Day, I, um, I was more organized. And um, although our MP didn't meet with us um, on that day, um, he did meet with us um, the day the IPCC released its report about 10 days later. And, and there were six or seven of us and we really organized well. And um, he said no to our ask. But um, it was much more satisfying, and he said it was the best meeting that he had ever attended with constituents. Well, that's impressive. It's <laughs> nice to get this kind of feedback, and I'm I'm glad to hear a couple of these stories. I think the, and I I suspect many of you have stories like this. I think um, I will just briefly share. There's a couple things, even just we've already talked about, which is meeting organization, having more than one person there the importance of doing follow-up, like you've already uh, hit on a few key points. Um, the, the one little anecdote I'll share is quite a number of years ago, I met, I, I actually didn't meet with my MP, but I was working on an initiative called Adopt an MP that a bunch of other youth climate activists and I were, were running and I had gotten called for um, an interview on CBC about, or one of the morning shows uh, about the Adopt an MP campaign. But because I'm sure many of you will identify with this because I was organizing the cam campaign nationally, I hadn't actually reached out to my own MP to, <laughs> to meet with him. So they said, they asked me on the, and so I, that evening was like, I better at least connect. So I, you know, sent him an email and said, hi, I'd like to meet with you. Um, and the next day on the radio, you know, this was like 5 p.m. This is now 7 a.m. the next morning. They said, have you, you know, have you met with your MP? And I said, oh, I haven't, you know, I haven't met yet. I've reached out, but I just haven't heard back and didn't like haven't heard back yet and tried to really make it like, oh, I'm sure. Well, I'm not worried. Um, and my MP actually called me up the next day and yelled at me <laughs> for, uh, for making him look bad on the radio. And I think he hadn't actually heard it, but one of his staff had. And I, I really remembered that both because it's a very strange experience to have your elected official call and yell at you on the phone, but also because it really reminded me that the public perception is so important. It's so critical to, to elected officials maintaining their jobs. And I think I, in an inexperienced moment, kind of tried to make it like make myself look good as opposed to make the MP look good. And I think he actually was an ally. He wasn't a problem. Um, and it was a good reminder that they uh, really care about their public image. So I think that's, that's something I think about um, in my engagements with elected officials. Um, I'm gonna run into some slides now. I mean, there aren't too many. Um, and the, and then I'm going to ask you all to do a little exercise in breakout rooms and we'll come back and talk about it. But I, I do want to thank Climate Action Network and we've already run through this because I, um, they made a really nice lobbying toolkit that I borrowed from and I know Kevin has made a really great toolkit for this group as well. So um, I think that will be a great resource. So there's a bunch of reasons uh, if you haven't met with your MLA before or MP or really any elected official, often you have a campaign, you have priorities, you need to make your positions known. The meeting provides balance. So industry lobbyists, as we know, meet with elected officials all the time. 
So you're, you can consider yourself providing a bit of balance. Um, there's a key point about building a relationship for ongoing engagement, which I think is particularly possible with MLAs as opposed to MPs who are a little bit harder to see and connect with all the time. And just a couple notes, and I think this is a group that is from all around BC, so this should work well, but your MLA may only meet with constituents or may strongly prefer to meet with constituents. And you may have seen auto responders saying, you know, if you're not a constituent, I'm not gonna answer your email. I certainly have seen that. Um, so do, do always, I think I have this in the next slide, include your postal code, say that you're a constituent, include your phone number, um, include your address if you want to, but for sure postal code and phone number. And then across the campaign, even if um, you really have a sense that, you know, in this party, <laughs> the MLAs are gonna be receptive and in this other party, they're not going to, it's still a good idea to meet with MLAs for multiple parties because you'll, at minimum, you will learn what their perspective is. It sounds like Marianne, you had a meeting where you, you, know, you didn't get your ask accepted, but it was still a good meeting and it's still an interesting encounter and you never actually know what the influence will be. I am, it's hard for me to keep track of the chat by the way, but um, I'm happy to be interrupted. So, um, so if you have something you wanna say during this, I would encourage you to unmute and just interrupt me at any point. So in terms of getting a meeting, this is obviously the first step. I have always gotten meetings through email, um, although I believe a uh, phone can also work well, especially for MLAs. Um, let them know your constituent, as I said, use the appropriate formal greeting. So, you know, be gracious, be friendly, let them know what topic you wanna to discuss, be sure to request a meeting in the email. Um, and uh, this should, hopefully get you a step in the right direction, especially with this first point of letting them know you're a constituent and providing the postal code and phone number. And I know, I believe Kevin or others are doing a bunch of the coordinating of meetings for your campaign effort. So this step may be taken care of for you for this purpose, but just in general, this is useful. Um, and I know, I think I Warren, you had, when we were chatting, you had said, you have successfully gotten meetings by calling up the constituency office. I don't know if you wanna say something about that or if anyone else wants to talk about initially getting a meeting. Yeah, I would just comment that I live in a small community, Salmon Arm, about 16, 70,000 people. And uh, over the years I've got to know, you know, you, you see the MLA as they wander around town, they do various things in the, in the area. In fact, uh, our longstanding MP, he's now retired, uh, was is one of my patients, which uh, <laughs> gives you a certain understanding of where um, that individual stands. It, it, the long-term relationship is what really makes a difference. If you've got a connection with somebody and you keep, you know, on various issues, not just one issue, but on several, you you get in touch with them. That seems to really it sort of rounds out the relationship, so it's not just monothematic, and that all also is a helpful thing. That's great. Thanks, Warren. Is there anything else anyone wants to jump in on on the getting a meeting process? I'll, I'll jump in on that. So I was actually uh, just getting bread the other week and I popped into my MLA's office and um, they yeah. sent an email and we got an appointment. So <laughs> it was pretty easy. Yeah. <laughs> the walk in the door approach which perhaps we can do again. It's nice that people are in their offices again. Um, I think that's, that's a great point. It happens that like Warren, I, I run into my provincial um, parliamentarian that my MPP all the time, she lives a block away from me and, um, and is a great ally. And I sort of don't feel the need to lobby her, which is a bit silly because it's always those people who you should also engage with. Um, so I'm not doing a very good job of implementing my own advice here, but it's true that you can, you can run into people. It can be really fruitful. Um, all right, meeting prep and Marianne made the point already about the importance of prep. I hear there's already a briefing note. So for the purposes of the meetings that are being organized right now, you already have it. But if you don't, for sure, prepare a briefing note. Um, there's a ton of examples of briefing notes online. 
there's, you know, whole trainings about this, but in general, what you'd want is a page or two with white space. So, you know, an easy to read um, couple of pages. You can do follow up with more details if you are invited to, but something really easy. Definitely find out how long the meeting will be and then make an agenda that you're going to follow. You don't necessarily have to, and I, I wouldn't necessarily suggest sending the agenda, but uh, make a meeting agenda that has lots of time for dialogue, which is where the relationship building happens. And I think this group, as a group of, um, of health professionals, you know, you would understand that it's in, it's in the two-way engagement that you build a relationship. It's not in the presenting and lecturing. Then, so to that end, if you're doing your presentation component, practice it, practice it a few times. We always go long. And by we, I mean humans. So um, you will go long, I will go long today. Practice this presentation component, prep any slides if you'll use them. Um, and in general, when I've done meetings, I plan for a presentation that's no longer than half the time, but ideally substantially less. And then in case your meeting gets cut short, which you very well might, start with your priority points and then identify a few key roles. Pausing in case someone wants to interrupt or ask a question. Yeah, Helen. I just wanted to ask if uh, most people are getting meetings face to face or they're still being mm -hmm. online. And if so, would you suggest preparing a few slides like this, Anjali? So when I've done, um, that's a great point. Um, when I've done the online meetings that I've been doing over the past year, often we have had a couple of slides, okay. um, but I think the best meeting that I had, we didn't have slides. Okay. It went so long that like the 45 minutes of Zoom timed right. out and the <laughs> MP like was like, re-enter the Zoom room. I want to keep talking to you. And it was me and um, a colleague, Jane, and neither of us were her constituents. It was just one of these scenarios where we made a human connection. You know, we didn't agree on everything, but had lots of interesting things to talk about. And, you know, we're going to ask for another meeting. And I think we're going to get it because, um, because we made that connection. So we could have had a couple slides at the start of that. And I think that would have been fine. But what I really took away from that versus other meetings that have been very presentation heavy is, um, is the importance of the relationship. Of kind of a chat. Yeah. <laughs> More Thank enjoyable you. for them too, right? Thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks for the question. So, so at the meeting, I personally want to say there's no need to be nervous. Um, you are people who people approach for, um, for advice, for perspectives. You are probably people, people, you are health people. So um, the thing you have in common with your MLA uh, or MP is, is that you are very busy and you want to spend your time wisely. So um, we, you want people to respect you in that way. We're gonna do the same thing for your elected officials. But as much as I can say, there's no need to be nervous. You might anyhow, it's fine. But uh, these are just people who happen to have gone through a different job route than us. So very briefly run through introductions, really thank them for the meeting. If there's any specific work that they or their party have done that is useful and aligned with your priorities, do thank them for that. You can briefly identify the problem and lean on your role as health professionals. Um, there's a good place to have an anecdote here, again, short. Advocate for solutions at a high level because everything we're talking about is too complicated to get into the details within your meeting time. And what you want is to build a relationship. So you'll build the relationship through the stories you tell, through the engagements you have, not through statistics or through the real meat of these issues, which you're about to talk about, I think a little more today, but that's where there's a lot of room for follow-up, which will be more successful if you've built the relationship and where their staff come in as well. And those are the people who often get really into the details. And then ask them what they think. And this is where you have hopefully a respectful dialogue. Um, and then do identify any follow-up and be sure to write down your follow-up points. Always send a thank you. 
again, just being respectful and appreciating their time, complete any tasks you've agreed to do quite promptly. And then especially because this is a local, this is a local person to Warren's point, if there's an upcoming event you can invite them to, if there's something going on, um, especially if it's not, not a political event. So like, I know there was the organization of an art show quite a long time ago at the beginning of the pandemic that then got cut off. Like that would be an example of something you could invite them to um, and then do follow up. And Warren, did you wanna jump in on this? And just the importance of a relationship also with, with office staff um, most M MPs and MLAs rely heavily on their staff. The staff, staff often work really hard to make sure that the MLA is either well informed or at least kind of shielded. Uh, there's, they often expect to get people coming in, if not yelling at them, certainly pressing them hard for responses. And um, the ones I've met in our writing, uh, MPs and MLAs, have always they'd be very appreciative of just, just being pleasant. You know, it's, uh, it goes a long way towards um, sort of softening them up and at some later time, maybe getting to pay more attention to you if they don't immediately. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally agreed. The way you get the next meeting is probably their staff as well. Um, okay, so just like I said, I, just like we all will in our M M MLA and MP meetings, um, I've run this a little bit late. Um, so I will look, maybe I'll end the, um, the slide share and see if there's any questions or experiences that we haven't, that haven't come up. And I might um, leave the breakouts for now, but I will say, I, maybe what I'll do just before we do that is show you what, um, what I was going to run, and you could do this exercise um, yourself at some point if you like, which is just to, to get going on some of the content, you know, to take five or 10 minutes to develop the introduction that connects to your working on, pick an anecdote, share your anecdote, this kind of thing. And then again, like, um, and I was just going to split into two groups, but develop a two minute description of a campaign solution and then end it with a question for your MLA. So I know this is being recorded and you'll, I'm happy to share these slides if you wanna use these exercises at another point. But the point that I'm trying to make is that, um, that the prep doesn't need to be super taxing. Like you just need to sit in a group and start thinking about it and keep those pieces really short. Um, and Mar Mara, please. Oh, hi. Sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry. I was in another meeting and I'm sorry that I'm late. Um, my question just was, and you, I hope we haven't covered this already. If um, the, is, it's probably the MLA in your own, your own MLA that your constituent of is more likely to see you if you ask for a meeting, right? Do you, for sure. Is there any use in asking for a meeting from someone who's not your MLA or I, like, so do they, are I, they under no obligation say... to see you? Yeah, I, I mean, don't know how that works. I, I would say yes, you you can always ask. It's okay. great if you can find someone who Who's is interested in, in the writing. Um, yeah. At least, at, and at least to have one person be there is really helpful because that person also opens the door. Um, but, you know, in what, like in a brief example that I gave, it was yeah. someone who I just said, I'm, I'm Cape. Uh, will you meet with us about this issue? And the MPs did say yes. So you can yeah. cer certainly ask. Because yeah. sometimes the first question they say is, am I your representative? Are you in my yeah. riding? Mm -hmm. And if you say no, then they're not, they're under no obligation to yeah. talk to you. That's certainly to, right. right. And it's, yeah. it speaks okay. to the, the, uh, the need to organize across geographies. Yes. But, uh, yes. but there's yes. no harm in asking. Yeah. Okay. That's and you really can helpful. credential yourself. You can say, I'm this, I'm that, I'm part of KBC, we're provincial, we're running this campaign, mm. it's relevant to your writing in this way. You know, make your case, see what happens. Yeah, okay, that's really yeah. helpful. Thank you, thank you no, very much. No Is there anything else, and I'm happy to um, have it be a question or just an, uh, other experiences or advice? Yeah, Warren? I think it's perfectly legitimate to, in, ask for a meeting with a minister who has um, a portfolio that's relevant to your mm -hmm. issue. 
uh, we've met with George Heyman, the Minister of Environment, and uh, a couple of other people. And over the years, um, I've met with people involved with health issues, not uh, necessarily related to the stuff we're talking about today. But when you present a reasonable case to them, they they will often be quite accommodating. It's not a not a difficult thing to do sometimes if you if you present it well. Um, yeah. As a kind of a related question, my MLA is the Minister of Education. So while she's my MLA, her portfolio doesn't have much to do with this. Um, I'm, I'm not sure beyond um, establishing a relationship with her as her constituent, if there's anything in particular I should be asking her for, um, given that her por portfolio doesn't directly relate to the issue. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think I heard the question was a little bit quiet, but um, but the the MLAs who are ministers are still your MLAs, and and there's you'll have to forgive that I don't have that strong a sense of uh, British Columbia governmental structures, but in general the 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 ministers are great people to meet with. They're the people who are are sitting at decision making tables. They're probably harder to get a meeting with. It happens. My MP is Krista Freeland. I'm like, I want a meeting with her. You know, I'm gonna bang down her door until I get a meeting because I'm like, you are a powerful person, and I want to meet with you. So I think in in a similar vein, you can certainly request a meeting to talk about um, issues that are relevant to your constituency. And I would say so much the better if you can manage to do it with a minister. But if, uh, but I'd be curious if anyone else has a take on, on that point. Makes, makes general sense. Yeah, get, for sure give it a try. Yeah. Thank you very much. Great, I think I'm, I've, um, I've hit my 30 minutes here. I'm going to stop and, uh, and turn it over, turn it back to Melissa. And because I'm in Toronto and it's a little bit late, I may also sign out somewhat shortly, but um, do feel free to be in touch if anyone doesn't have my email. I've just um, popped it in the chat and I'm always happy to, um, to engage. Although I will say on this topic specifically, you have a lot of experienced people within the BC group who can, I think, do a lot of organizing and advice. So I'm happy to have organized a presentation for you today. Um, and it was, I think it's always nice to, to see everyone, um, but I think you're probably in pretty good shape as well. Thank okay. you so much, Anjali, for joining us on Eastern time. Have a good night. And um, yeah, we'll report back and let you know how, how we did with your awesome advice. All right, so um, the next, section we're going to move in is a bit about the, of the background, about the health risks of um, fracked natural gas within BC, both local and global. And the first speaker we have to talk about fracking's impacts on environmental and global health is Dr. Warren Bell, who you've already heard from tonight. He is a family physician um, living and working in Salmon Arm, and he is the past founding president of CAPE. Take it away, Warren. Warren, you're muted. There we are. Slides and voices. We got everything here. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the background uh, about fracking in BC and then and look at some of the harms. So let's just go straight ahead. And wouldn't it be nice if this advanced? Um, we're not advancing Melissa, not quite sure why. I've got the screen here. So I'm going to stop sharing and start all over again and see if this is this is how computers work. You just change them around. And then you do this there. Maybe that'll work. Well, that's very interesting because Slides. Warren, are you are you using uh, are you clicking with your mouse or are you using the cursor or the keys on the keyboard? I am using my direction keys on my uh, keyboard, which usually works extremely well. Hmm. Um, so I don't want to keep on showing you the same slide all evening long. That would probably 
not be an attractive thing. Um, let's just try this again. There we are. Something magical happened. I don't know who did what, but I'm very happy that it happened. So fracking and, and the climate crisis is part of a, a bigger issue, the global existential crisis that we're all in. Now, my goodness, we are hung up again. This is very peculiar. Okay, let's try this. I have no idea why we're having such issues. Okay, this, let's hope this keeps on going. Some, some definitions. Um, natural gas is essentially methane. Uh, methane is the simplest hydrocarbon. Um, a greenhouse gas is a gas that absorbs and traps heat in the atmosphere. And uh, methane, which is what is mostly fracked in BC, is right in there in the mix, one of the important ones. Fossil fuels, uh, there's basically three, coal, oil, and natural gas, which is methane. And I'm, I'm emphasizing methane because it's critical you understand that this is a particular gas with particular properties, which we'll come to in a moment. So a little bit of information. This is one particular fact about methane you should all know about, and that is that it, it's much more potent as a greenhouse gas uh, over approximately 20 years. It's still more potent over 50 years, but in the first 20 years, it's massively more potent as a greenhouse gas. It traps heat much more effectively than carbon dioxide. Second point is that when fracking is carried out, there is a, a problem called fugitive emissions. In other words, gas leaks from the wellhead and from various other places. It also leaks out of wellheads that have been decommissioned and plugged. They don't get plugged, they leak for years afterwards, about 25% of all wells do that. So methane is being discharged into the atmosphere constantly from all of the wellheads in any particular field. So how did this all happen in British Columbia? It didn't just come out of the air. Very interesting. Some of you may remember Gordon Campbell, you remember his carbon tax, that was some, something that was considered pretty advanced. Well, Gordon uh, Campbell did another thing. He approached the Agricultural Land Commission and he, he pressured them to amend the act so that they could delegate uh, decision-making powers to someone else. Now, it doesn't say who else it was, this is 2002, but in 2004, this is what happened. And this was the underlying purpose of it. The Agricultural Land Commission delegated decision-making about land use to the Oil and Gas Commission and no, um, no necessity for uh, the ALC to be involved was there anymore. It, it had disappeared from the regulatory process. And here's one of the agreements that, that was back in 2004, but every year they renew the agreement. This is 2017. And in this agreement, there's one key, doc, key part of it. And that is that the two entities, the Agricultural Land Commission and the Oil and Gas Commission, agree that oil and gas activities and ancillary activities located in the identified ALR lands are exempt from the requirement of an application under the agricultural side of things. In other words, oil and gas people, they can do whatever they want in essence. And in fact, um, Ulrike lives in the part of the world where all this is happening and she knows full well how hard it is to stop the Oil and Gas Commission from getting something going. And this is another way to describe it colloquially. Um, that's exactly what it is. You're allowing the Oil and Gas Commission to decide what happens on all sorts of land without any input from other sources. Now, going through decade by decade, 1950, a total of 15 wells in uh, Treaty 8 territory, which is the northeast corner of BC. Actually, this is Blackberry River um, land. By a little far, a lot farther along, it's underneath my um, heading here. So I'm just going to go back. Uh, you can see the wells. By 1990, there's 5,400. 2011, there's 16,000 uh, and change. And then look what's happened um, about five years ago. The, almost the entire territory is taken up. This is the Blueberry River First Nations, David Suzuki and another uh, academic group did this atlas. It's astonishing. The land has been completely swamped and this is five years ago. You can imagine what it's like today. 
Um, not only that, but if you look on the left, you'll see all those little spidery lines. Those are mini pipelines. We hear about the Northern Gateway and Trans Mountain expansion, stuff like that. But in the territory where all these projects are taking place, there's a little mini pipeline sliding all over the landscape. You can see Fort St. John in the middle there. On the left, on the right hand side are um, the tenures, the ability that has been purchased or arranged by a company to do development if it wants to. And you can see on this map, there's also lots of little lines on it. And those are also boundaries between one tenure and another. And there's no boundaries. They're all contiguous. They all overlap. Astonishing degree of development in this territory. And I will just mention that the Blueberry River Nation just won a major court decision to stop this cumulative impact problem. But we'll, we won't talk about that tonight. So the big problem with the full life cycle of fracking and especially fracking for natural gas known as methane is that fugitive, fugitive emissions are huge and they are the reason that it's not any better than oil and, gas, oil and coal. This is an article, uh, a paper that was written by Robert Howarth, a professor at Cornell who has studied these matters at great length. And here's what he said, both the fracked gas, which the, he calls shale gas here, that's the American term, and conventional natural gas have a larger greenhouse gas footprint than do coal and oil for any possible use of natural gas, which is methane. So methane, this 84 times more powerful greenhouse gas is being produced in such quantities from fracking that it's making natural gas production, extraction and use more dangerous for the climate than oil and coal. Now that's not what you've heard from Christy Clark and John Horgan uh, and other political leaders, but, it, but I can tell you this is what science says about this subject. Um, that's the article in case you want to want to locate it. It's, um, it's in the scientific literature. Now, everybody's familiar with these graphs. This I, I, I use this one because it covers a long, long timeline, 800,000 years. And you can see at the very end on the right how extreme and how rapid the increase in carbon dioxide. And this is carbon dioxide, not methane. Methane, on a much smaller time scale, is also increasing. This, this graph is from the um, IPCC's most recent report just came out a few weeks ago, uh, showing that methane production, natural gas leaking into the air, has been uh, increasing just as much as carbon dioxide has. So BC has an unenviable, terrible record for reducing uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. In transport, it's going up because there's more people living in the province and they all drive vehicles. Um, but you can see the second line down, the sort of uh, light brown, is showing also an increase um, over the last 15 or 25 years. And that's because we have done zero to reduce the, uh, the greenhouse gas production in this province. Whatever you may hear from our public leaders, this is the reality. And this, by the way, is from a government site. And it doesn't include the greenhouse gas produced by burning forests which is huge as well. So what are the impacts? Local impacts are what happens in the area, okay? Pollution of all sorts, including the fugitive emissions that escape and get into the air. If you live in an area where there's a lot of fracking, the noise and light pollution is, can be horrendous. Uh, Orike, I'm sure, can have stories to tell about that. It's everywhere in some parts of the world. And it's in, in the farmland areas. Wildlife, of course, are not, um, tolerant of the noise, the pollution, the light flashing all the time, and the, the vehicles driving down these newly created roads over the place. And many other activities really stop happening. Farmers sell out and move to the city and just take money from the oil companies to let them develop their land. Quiet enjoyment. If you have a farm and you live in the country, that's very important to you. And suddenly it disappears when these wellheads go in. The water consumption level is huge. It's sucking down water tables in certain areas and contaminating them with various uh, substances used in fracking. Now, looking at the global, the global side of the story, of course, everybody knows after our heat dome and all the deaths from it, 
and the wildfires that are getting worse uh, decade by decade, that heating the planet is taking place because of this. The oceans are acidifying. The re that sounds modest as an effect, but it is profoundly important in disrupting ocean ecosystems. Glaciers are melting, and there are already communities and island states and coastal uh, uh, locations that are already being affected. New York City had a, a storm surge that pretty much drowned people in their basement suites recently. Infectious disease, we're physicians, we're seeing diseases that were not known prior to the warming of the planet. And we're now seeing, for example, Lyme disease in British Columbia, not a lot, and it's mostly in the Southern areas, but it is starting to turn up here. Extreme weather events, well, I think everybody who's listening tonight and watching this knows what that's like. We've seen some extraordinary uh, extreme weather events. And it's interesting how it affects all of us in our hearts and our minds. Um, an Australian philosopher coined the term solastalgia, which means when you're at home and looking outside and around your area, you feel homesick because what you used to have in your home is gone. It's not there anymore. And then of course, food and water insecurity. I live in the middle of a farming area and I can tell you some of the farmers are horrified by the way their crop production has been grossly distorted by the extreme heat that we've had in this area. I'm just gonna show you a few pictures to end up. This is something, 100 Mile House, is something that was all over the province this past summer. That's Lytton on its way out. This is Terrace, which in, was flooding almost <laughs> during the worst heating uh, process because, by the way, it's because of glacier melt, much of it. The glaciers are disappearing because of the heat. Vancouver even, this large urban center that uh, so many people live in, um, that's not exactly a pretty sight to see. Uh, we all know about the deaths and heat dome. It depends on where you were and how many you're, how you were counting them, but there were many, many older folks who got into severe difficulty and a number of them died. Estimates start from 590 and then you broaden the area, you get more. California, storm surges, even just regular surf moving up on houses that were previously far away from the ocean's edge. And the horror that I think most of us felt when we heard that a billion life forms uh, living in the intertidal zone because of the nature of the tides, but also mostly because of the heat, were simply, were simply destroyed. It's, uh, it's not something we like. Um, I wanna close by just getting back to the whole psychological impact. This is a recent uh, poster that was made showing all the different news outlets around the world, Japan, Britain, France, Germany, United States, and Spain, all talking about how so many young people are going through anxious times. Many, many feel that they'll never live to a full life expectancy because of what's going on. I think that's underlying the poignancy of our uh, obligation to future generations to help prevent some of these tragic and harmful impacts on their minds and their thoughts and their hopes. And that's it. Gone. Thank you so much, Warren. Um, that was a really, I think, motivating presentation that tells us the reasons why um, it's really important for us to take action on fracking and, and fracked gas within BC and also what's happening on a global scale and within our province and within the Pacific Northwest. Um, that's great. So next, it is my distinct pleasure um, to introduce Dr. Ulrika Meyer, who is a family physician who lives and works in the heart of fracking country in Dawson Creek in the Peace Region. And she's also co-investigator in a UBC Family Practice Grant to study the local health effects of fracking. And she is going to tell us about what she's seen firsthand in terms of the local health harms of fracking. Go ahead, Dr. Meyer. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you, Warren, for the good background on fracking. <laughs> As you mentioned, it really took up here in 2004 and uh, the northeast of BC is maybe 90,000 people living here. And in the past, it was single well pads. Now there can be um, up to 60, 40 and on one pad. So lots of traffic going to bring the water in, to bring the frac fluid in. And uh, 
the compressor station, gas plants, holding ponds for the wastewater, they will take up in the future 25% of the agricultural land reserve, which is also not to underestimate the Peace River is a breadbasket too. We grow canola, um, wheat, oats, uh, beef, like it is a normally nice area here. It's a beautiful country, but it is changed quite a bit. So the unconventional natural gas development is close to residential area, farmers, schools, waterways, and that is exposure 24 seven. You cannot, so for instance, um, if you look at farming, which is quite overdeveloped, it's such industrialized area close to their school, the Parkland school, they have an emergency plan because they have a gas plant close by and they also have bell pads. So if there's a fallout and the H2S would rise, the teacher or whoever's in charge that day has to decide if it's safe for the kids to bring them to the bus, which is parked right in front of the school, or if they shut off the furnace and each classroom has duct tape and they will duct tape all doors and windows and hope for the best. And does not, not feel good for people living and send their kids there. Oil and gas workers have seven times higher mortality rate than other industries. And this is due to the exposure to chemicals. Last year, we had this 26 year old diagnosed with stage four esophageal cancer with METS. And it was so sad to see, just married with a young child and he has no family history, non-smoker, his only risk factor was working for the oil and gas industry. And he was dying at age 27 at Christmas last year. It was really sad to see. We also observed local uh, health flags. Our radiologist um, said in 2018, I have my 10th case of glioblastoma and he worked prior in Cape Town and he knows what the incident should be. And glioblastoma being the malignant form of brain cancer, as we know, and not a long survival rate um, can be connected with radiation. There is natural occurring radioactive material that comes, comes out with the fracking process. In the fracking fluid are also radioactive materials to mark certain um, gases. And so it is even then enhanced, we call it enorm. And so if there's a relation, we don't know, but we see it even in younger women, like the youngest I'm aware is 28, she was pregnant 20 weeks. She was a daughter of a colleague in this area in a neighbor town, and she had to abort the fetus in order to go for treatment for glioblastoma. Normally the age range would be between 45 and 70, you would expect, right? And uh, some are 32, have three kids on board and they, they last longer, they live longer because they're so young with a cancer diagnosis, they have a bit longer life expectancy. Then we had Dr. Suksakaria, he worked as an internist here for two years and also that was from 16 to 18 and he said, I have so many cases of idiopathic interstitial fibrosis and he had 10 cases, could not find any other reason, no lupus, no asbestos exposure, nothing. And again, um, deadly disease main survival is three to five years, no treatment available. And we don't know why we have the increased rate. But if you look at idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, it's more occurrent in highly industrialized zone, uh, zones of countries. England is really good with their number. And we would maybe expect 1.5 cases per 30,000, not 10 cases. When they did autopsy on people who died of idiopathic um, pulmonary fibrosis, they found silica and aluminum in the hilar lymph nodes close to their lungs compared to other people um, in autopsies and said, and silica is one of the main component in frac sand. So there could be a relationship too. Previously had Dr. Lambiotti was an internist in Dawson Creek and he left us because he said it's an unhealthy region. He didn't want to expose his kids to the uh, toxins. And he diagnosed endothelial lymphosarcoma in three people. He said the incidence is one in 500,000. Why do I see three in Dawson Creek, right? That was just for Dawson Creek. So he was quite concerned and unfortunately left us. Then we were fortunate to have Dr. Elise Caron Baudouin to come to our area. First time she came as a PhD toxicologist, um, toxicologist in 2016. And she had funding 
also by the First Nation to look at um, a pilot study for 30 pregnant women in our area. She collected hair and urine samples. And in the hair, she found increased levels uh, of aluminum, barium, uh, manganese, and strontium. The most shocking part was the barium. Barium is a rock bound, which you find in the Montney Formation which we walk on, but it's like two to three kilometers below us and where the fracking is happening. So rock bound means it should not be in people elevated, right? And so that was quite uh, concerning. And unfortunately in indigenous women, the levels were higher than in the non-indigenous counterparts. In the urine of these pregnant women, she found increased benzene metabolites and uh, there are known hormone disruptors and high exposure um, to benzene during pregnancy is associated with low birth weight, preterm birth or um, childhood leukemia and birth defects, especially cardiac birth defects. Um, as a follow-up, she did in 2020, uh, she looked at over 6,000 births in Fort St. John Hospital over a 10 year period. And uh, she developed a neat way to look at the postal code of these women and um, put on top the Oil and Gas Commission maps for all the infrastructure, if it's compressor station, multi-well pads, whatever's around these women. And then she could uh, look at the radius. She looked at 2.55 and 10 kilometer radius around these women's home. And she found for the 2.5 kilometer radius an increased risk of preterm birth and uh, for five and 10 kilometers an increased incidence of low birth weight babies. And uh, she also returned in 2019 to do a biometric study and she was funded for 100 pregnant women. And at the same time, she's besides hair and urine, she's also doing nail sampling, or she did. And she collected air, indoor air uh, and uh, tap water from their kitchen sink. And she published just this week the results from the uh, water and air results. And it shows that uh, there were 40 volatile organic compounds uh, in the air and four volatile organic compounds in the water, which is quite concerning. It was um, benzene and uh, tololine, and uh, it's just, yeah, the list is long. And so she did also find that again, for women of this indigenous background, that their levels were higher than non-indigenous women. And she looked for if somebody's smoking or if their garage is attached to the house, is there a fireplace where you could create volatile organic compounds too. The results from the biometric uh, um, study part is in the works, but it, we will see what it will be later coming out. We have ongoing research we want to be created. There's silver linings always. And I think this reaching out to Cape uh, when the health flex were raised by my colleagues, there's no other way to go about it. The politicians, nobody wants to have a concern, not our health authority. There's no harm to humans, they say. And that's their line. And uh, we went to the Oil and Gas Commission. There's nothing what you can do. So reaching out to Cape was a really superb idea. And Warren uh, Bell came out with Larry Bazalai for a site visit, met with stakeholders here in the hospital, toured the area, and then went via Kitimat um, down south. And so um, we did a speaking tour down south and then formed a research team where we were approached and it's quite amazing team. They all volunteer their time. It's hard to find funding and we want to look at asthma exacerbation in this area. So there's lots of health flex up there, even at least with self study findings in air and water approached um, a public health officer, but there's no appetite to look further in or that the health authority would support any further research, which is quite disappointing. I think I will try to go to my MLA too. <laughs> Although he worked for the local gas company, I'm not sure how successful I will be to find an open ear, but I think it is really important to reach out and make aware people um, that there is a health risk living here. Many who work for the industry, they cannot speak up, they will lose their job. 
And when my friend and previous neighbor, Karen, uh, an environmental consultant, we toured the neighborhood to get neighborhood letters to prevent a multi pet development close to our homes. Many, yeah, are afraid to speak up or say it's paceable and as long as it's not in front of my house, I'm fine with it. So it's hard to raise the awareness in this region where most are involved in oil and gas um, industry and it provides a good livelihood for them and um, also the local politicians not having really an open ear for concerns raised. But nothing makes fracking safe, nothing. So in the end, it should be a moratorium in my view because really nothing can make it safe. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ulrika. I have to say every time I listen to you or anyone from the piece speak about what's happening locally, it's just horrifying every every single time. And thank you, I mean, for being such a strong advocate, continuing to speak, continuing to do the research, continuing to connect with us. I'm, I'm so glad that you did connect so many, those, you know, those many years ago, because you're such, a, you're such an incredible advocate for, for your local population. So thank you so much. And there'll be some, some questions later. Um, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to, sh I'm just going to share my screen here and I'm I just want to talk a little bit about the local, uh, sorry, the indoor air quality risks of natural gas, because you know, what's really interesting is, is that like a lot of people don't know what's happening up North. And certainly when I moved to BC five years ago, I had no idea what was happening in Northern BC. And so part of what we're trying to do is bring those stories of the North down South. But I think sometimes it's hard for people to identify with them because they're not from that area. They don't know what the flares are like. They don't, they don't see their neighbors developing brain cancers and, and fatal lung diseases, but they do have gas stoves. And so we have tried to highlight um, this point about indoor air quality being affected in a negative way by burning um, gas stoves in, in our campaign. And in fact, when I look at kind of what's out there in a popular way, like on Facebook, or even with my own patients actually approaching me saying, hey, I, I heard about your campaign. It's the indoor air quality effects that they often point out from their gas stoves because that's what they're familiar with. Anyway, so I'll just give I'll just a, a few quick slides about, about that. Um, so this is the Switch It Up BC campaign and Kate helped contribute to it. Um, and I'll just go through a few stats. So in terms of the health risks of home natural gas use, the two major risks would be climate and indoor air quality. So together, BC's natural gas homes produce the same amount of climate pollution per year as over 870,000 vehicles. Um, currently close to 1 million BC households heat or cook with natural gas. And unfortunately, this number is increasing despite the fact that we actually should be weaning ourselves off fossil fuels. So for example, last year, um, the provincial natural gas utility, which I won't name, connected an additional 13,000 homes. So natural gas use, unfortunately, is increasing despite the climate risks. And in terms of indoor air quality, this is what a lot of my patients and a lot of people seem to be concerned about. So natural gas kitchen appliances pollute your home with nitrogen dioxide. Um, and this has been shown in research that it could exacerbate asthma attacks in children with asthma and also um, other people with chronic lung diseases. In 2015, Health Canada actually issued new indoor nitrogen dioxide um, safe exposure limits. And in fact, most existing gas ranges do not meet Health Canada's own long-term NO2 standard. So, uh, and again, it's been shown to, to have more health effects over and above just exacerbating lung disease. So I'd encourage you to check out this website, switch it up, ac.ca to explore a bit more about the indoor um, health effects. So I just quickly, you know, want to talk about the asks that we have um, as part of our campaign and as part of what we're asking you to bring forth to your MLAs. And I think based on what you've heard from um, from Warren, from Ulrika, and then, uh, you know, for me about the indoor health effects. I think these are, these are founded um, in, in a lot of evidence and I think are what we need to move forward and, and uh, to make sure that everyone in BC from the north to the south um, is going to realize a healthy future. So number one, as Ulrika said, we're, we're asking for a moratorium on fracking expansion, um, not fracking altogether because that might be a bit of a steep ask for the for the um, province. So essentially because natural gas extraction harms the health of people living near fracking wells and intensifies the climate crisis, the BC government should stop all new fracking development. Our second ask is for zero emissions building. 
So we're asking that natural gas hookups should be banned in all new buildings by 2023 with buildings in the north because there's less supply of tradespeople um, given until 2025 to comply. And we're asking that the province invest in retraining programs for workers to build affordable zero emissions buildings and retrofit all existing buildings for zero emissions. So for example, in Vancouver where we live, 50% of our climate pollution comes from basically natural gas burning in buildings. So by reducing these hookups, we can obviously have a pretty significant impact on, on BC's overall climate pollution. We're asking number three for a best transition. So we're saying that support must be provided to workers and Indigenous communities impacted by LNG production to transition to a clean energy economy, including financial support for retraining and a guarantee of good zero emissions jobs. And really this is, and I think this is something that we're pushing every, a lot of people are pushing for across Canada. They're saying, well, how about the jobs? Like how am I going to feed my family? And the thing is these jobs are finite, they're boom and bust. Um, and if we if we train workers for for these long term clean energy jobs, it'll be much better for our overall health and then much more stable for them too. But um, this is a criticism that that we've often gotten. But there is you know there are stats that show that investments in the clean energy economy return a lot more significantly more to um, like to our economy than investments in fossil fuels. So anyway, we're asking for just transition transition. And our final ask is to end fossil fuel subsidies to stop making natural gas so artificially cheap in this province. So we're asking that the provincial governments end all fossil fuel subsidies as defined by the WTO, including direct spending, tax breaks, transfer of risk, and public finance. And you can find all these asks and more information um, on our website, unnaturalgas.org, uh, that was put together by the amazing Dr. Kevin Liang. Um, and I'm just going to open the floor up to questions that people may have about any aspects of our presentations, or um, if you want to talk a bit more about scheduling a meeting with your MLA, please go ahead and raise your hand if you'd like to, if you'd like to speak, raise your, raise your Zoom hand. Chad, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, is meeting, in, when meeting with your MLA, is meeting with more than one person, uh, a, a physician or otherwise recommended as a preferred way to go about it? Meaning more than one person in the meeting itself or multiple meetings? No, sorry, more than one person in the meeting. I've heard them refer to having uh, perhaps more effective with a group of people at that meeting, like your two or three physicians or healthcare workers. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's a good idea. Again, strength in numbers. And then it just indicates that there are more people who are interested in that in that topic and mm -hmm. want action on it. And to the question of whether or not there should be multiple meetings, I, like the more the better. Essentially, the more they hear from different constituents that they're concerned, the more that issue will be will be front of mind. Because that's something I've wondered about before is, you know, is, is it just too repetitive? But actually, repetition is good from trusted messengers like healthcare professionals. So yeah, definitely um, strength in numbers. And then often, if if you have a bit um, of a bigger group, they'll give you a bit more time also. I know I tried to meet solo with my MLA and he gave me 15 minutes. But when I said, I, I tried, I scheduled a follow-up meeting and I said, there are multiple people. He gave, he gave us half an hour. So that might, it might also help with timing. Marianne, go ahead. Lauren, could you explain the lower, uh, the lower graph on the methane. I couldn't figure out what yeah, the lower half of the of the methane graph. The, the one where there's the carbon dioxide it's kind graph. Kind of sinusoid. Yeah, I mean, well, the, that, that's because there's se there's uh, seasonal variations in methane as well because there is some natural methane produced not from fracking. So there's a fluctuation. If you if you see the graph from Mauna Loa the, the um, station on, in Hawaii that measures carbon dioxide, it's a sawtooth graph, it goes up like that. And that's because there's a change in atmospheric levels through the seasons. So there's an annual fluctuation. But the, you can see in, in both those graphs, I don't know if I can go back to it um, and share, I'll just see if I can get to it quickly. Is 
So it's part of them. Um, yes, there we are. Yeah, this is the one. Uh, there's two differences between the graphs. The first one for carbon dioxide is covering 800,000 years. And so it's a much, yeah. a much larger time scale. With the graph for yeah. methane at the bottom, the, the, you have the same annual fluctuations. And, uh, but what is important is that although the slope is not so extreme as in the carbon dioxide graph, that's simply because the time scale is much more, much stretched out much more for the one below. It's compressed 800,000 years in one page in the carbon dioxide graph, but only, what is it, 20, 35 years total from one side of the methane graph to the other. So you don't see the sharp slope, but it is steadily increasing. Mm -hmm. If it was methane on the bigger graph, you'd see a much steeper curve. The bottom part, by the way, the blue and the red in the bottom mm -hmm. part is the rate of increase. And the rate of increase uh -huh. is slowly <laughs> decreasing, but it's still increasing. It's not, it's, it's flattening out, but it's not, not disappearing. So. Thank you. Sure. Warren, your own hand is raised. Did you have a comment? Yes, yeah, so I just gonna say that when you go to uh, an MLA or an MP's office, they will always have their own people there. You never, you almost never meet them alone. And sometimes there'll be two or three of them. I, I think the number of times I've ever met an MP or an MLA so uh, with them only in the room is, uh, you know, one finger, <laughs> whereas 10 times they have their aides, they have somebody keeping notes, they have somebody prompting, you know, uh, sometimes prompting the political person for, for some information to make sure that it's enunciated, that kind of thing. So I don't think you should ever feel uncomfortable about bringing one or two people with you. It's, it's, um, it's, it's a good support system for both sides. Good points, Maureen. Um, Ruth, you have you have your hand up. Would you like to ask a question? Uh, yes. So um, I'm not a doctor, um, and I I've been looking into fracking a little bit. Um, I was in touch with a woman in Alberta who was telling me about some of the health effects that her and her uh, you know neighbors and things were experiencing because of wells in the area. And I asked her what her doctor said about, it. and she just said, you know they didn't say anything. I'm, I'm just wondering, is there a reporting system where doctors are supposed to, you know, look for the cause of unusual symptoms? It's a really frustrating process, even if I had patients who were passing out in the end because, uh, and I, I ruled everything out. He was a fit farmer, liked dancing, and he said, I have the sensation of passing out. Then it got worse, and he was driving the tractor and passed out, and then playing cards with his friend, and he was passing out. It lasted for three years, and then when I did the environmental history, he had all these wastewater tanks who were in the winter with heaters connected outside this uh, big sea rings, right? It's all wastewater. So in the winter, this being kept open and warm, it steamed up to his house and he must have inhaled, inhaled quite a bit of toxins. That was the only explanation because once they packed up the sea rings with the wastewater were removed, there was no fracking going up to his farm. I think it was surrounded by three sites. He didn't pass out anymore, it was resolved. Is there any way I can report it or anything? No, I told him it's most likely from that cause or people coming in uh, with neuropathy, they feel not their feet, it feels like they're walking on felt pads. And then this woman tells me she lives in the countryside, she has a compressor station on her property close to the house. And if she looks out her front window, there's a body of water and flames 24 seven, right? And so I said, she did nerve conduction studies, which were within the normal range, but I told her it's probably neurotoxins she's exposed to. So I made the link, I tried to do an environmental history. Same with nosebleeds, if you have lots of exposure to volatile organic compounds, they can cause sinusitis, but also nosebleeds. And some people are more sensitive and get quite extreme uh, symptoms. But it's always good to take an environmental history. I'm maybe now fine-tuned living here, and see people where I cannot find any explanation except from environmental history. Yeah. And you still have to do your homework and investigate and rule anything else out. I would love if there was a fund where you could do toxicology study and levels in these people to see what's uh, 
going on, but your MSP will not pay for it and the industry for sure will not pay for it either or there's no fund set up, unfortunately. Oh. Ulrika, have you tried to report this to anyone um, or make this public other than through us in any way? And what kind of um, reception have you gotten? I think we did a public meeting, but there was not much uptake either because people don't like to come to public meetings because if you work for the industry, you might be reported. And so we did talk about it. But other than that, no, I didn't go to Northern Health necessarily. No. So, like, you know, as a lay person, it seems that our doctors should be involved in monitoring these things or bringing those concerns to someone if our government is saying this is safe. I mean, I know doctors are definitely doing their job. It just seems unbelievable to me that we don't have a system where health professionals can take care of their patients to understand the cause of their illness and highlight. Um, when you know strange you illnesses are happening, it. you cannot say this is hundred percent. Yeah, but you cannot prove it hundred percent except doing extensive investigation, which are not covered, and most person or people will not uh, pay out of pocket for first investigation when we do toxicology tests, right? So it's most people won't be able to do it. It would be great, but you cannot otherwise prove it. I can say there seems to be the most likely explanation, right, for the patient's symptoms. Even with a young man with a esophageal cancer end stage at 26, like this is, is shocking, right? And it's so sad, but would we necessarily be able to prove it, that it was his exposure at oil and gas and working as a, swamp donkey in the tanks and cleaning them, it's high toxic load, right? Makes maybe most likely sense, but you have to, the industry will say just, where's the proof, right? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Warren, go ahead. Yes, I, I've been doing this for many years, uh, looking at environmental toxins, uh, began many years ago with pesticides, and now it's continued to a whole range of other substances. 80,000 to 85,000 of the industrial chemicals dispersed into the environment, um, and fracking just another source. But there's three reasons why doctors don't pursue this. First of all, uh, public health uh, staff are employees of the government. That means that their salaries are dependent on their uh, behaving appropriately. And we've had public health physicians say things to us privately that they have told us, please do not repeat this in public. And, that's, and there are examples in this country of public health physicians who have been terminated without cause because they've investigated environmental contaminants. So that's the first thing you're dealing with in public health terms, employees who are on salary and therefore vulnerable. The second thing is physicians are trained to believe and to understand that diseases arise within people. They don't come from external sources, from exogenous sources. Now, of course, infections are different, but when it comes to environmental chemicals, we don't get training at all in medical schools. And that's because there are no environmental medical specialists in the training program of most medical schools. There, are, there is now work being done on atypical diagnoses, diagnoses that fall outside, even, even a collection of symptoms that are not a defined disease as we know it, that are occurring in people because of exposures. But we don't, uh, we don't have a mechanism in the training program for identifying these exogenous sources. Um, third thing is labs that will do the measurements that we would need to have done are extremely few and far between. In the United States, for example, there's basically two laboratories, one on the West Coast, one in the East Coast, that do unusual uh, exposure measurements. And otherwise, you have to go to research facilities. You cannot get these measurements done. I, I'll give you an example. I had a patient who was, um, lived in another community where it was rural. She had two children, no problems. She came to our community. She lived in the middle of an orchard that belonged to the family that was using a lot of pesticides. She had three successive miscarriages. The third was 24 weeks, just short of viability. It was horrible, but she was, she was a tough lady. She, uh, the, the family changed over to using a detergent based, um, it wasn't safer soap, it was something from, I don't know, Amway or something like that, on their orchard. And she went on after three more pregnancies and children without interruption. It was like, 
two healthy, three miscarriages, and then three healthy children when they switched over to a different kind of relatively benign sort of insect control mechanism. Um, I've looked over the years for laboratories that would do tests on toxic exposures, and most of them are shut down, and they're just very hard to find. And um, so we have a kind of a consciousness raising process that needs to take place across the board to identify exogenous toxins as causes of illness. Thanks, Warren. Um, yeah, excellent comprehensive explanation. I actually just wanted to highlight a, a question that someone had, um, Cheryl Vinchoff, actually, she was asking, I'm, I'm sure to, to Dr. Meyer, where is the school that has, that has the plan for the gas issue? That would be in Farmington, which is outside uh, Dawson Creek, and the school is a Parkland school. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, Marianne, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, so um, have the uh, medical schools been interested at all, Ulrika and, and Warren and any of this? Um, it's hard for me to believe that with you know, work safe and occupational health, that there isn't, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure you've explored those <laughs> paths, um, yes. but what about medical schools? I mean, when, I mean, that's pretty, uh, when, you know, with, with the um, really notable increase in rate of uh, unusual illnesses, um, well, uh, let me comment in medical schools. Uh, they're essentially staffed by specialists and specialists in the traditional disciplines like urologists and neurologists and internal medicine specialists and cardiologists. There is no active environmental medicine specialty in, uh, there are people who specialize in that area, but in the past, they were always looking at people who were hypersensitive and, and it was a, a more akin to allergy issues. But in medical school training, it's even, even having family physicians uh, uh, do medical, uh, medical school training, they don't come in until third and fourth year. Uh, basic um, primary care training doesn't begin until far uh, well through the, the whole medical process. But the the magnitude of the problem is so great that it's starting to come from outside. Uh, people like Ruth, who was speaking earlier, and others have started to address these issues um, and say, why aren't you training, just as you asked, Marianne, why aren't you training doctors to look for exogenous sources of, of disease? Let me give one example that's very current. Um, COVID-19, everybody's thinking about these days. Um, there's been a couple of studies looking at PFAS. Now, PFSA stands for polyfluorinated alkyl substances, and Teflon and Scotchgard belong to this family. There's about 5,000 members. They are ubiquitous, and they're essentially indestructible. If you get COVID and you have a high level of body burden of PFAS, one, one, any of the 5,000 members of this class, your, your um, illness is likely to be more severe. And this study was done by some very well-known toxicologists who don't have any access to grind, but they're very knowledgeable about toxicology. You haven't heard a word about it anywhere because it's just not, it, it's often just not on the radar. It's not being considered as something we should be looking at. So we as a, as a species have a lot of learning to do about what we've done. We all know about climate change. We are, what we've done to the planet and how we need to start addressing it um, in a much more detailed, you know, granular way, as they say. Right now, it's it's very very limited what's going on. I think to add also, I think it's a missing curriculum. And if you look at functional medicine, where you look at the root cause for any problem in a specific person, and you look at everything, the environment, the trauma, and you populate it from preconception to now, it's a nice approach. And they, there's one um, functional medicine uh, practitioner, and he said, it's a missing curriculum we miss in medical school. It should be ethic, it should be philosophy, it should be toxicology, environmental science, all the things we need to know to actually make good physicians, right? And we practice in reactionary medicine, which is outdated, right? Because 
you don't prevent any chronic diseases or to optimize the health of the person. And it's uh, this functional medicine, it's quite satisfying because you would look at this person and what's happening to this person. It could be, it's quite interesting what ticks maybe that person cannot methylize their folate and is not a methylizer or was exposed to amalgam as a child, who knows, right? But to find out for this specific case, what is ticking and what can be improved things, but it takes way more time. And I think this uh, 15 minutes appointment, if you're luxury <laughs> and to MSP billing scheme, it will move along and medical schools have to change their curriculum to change uh, the outcomes. It's unfortunate. Also with the aspect of workers comp, if they're not looking over things, most workers will not report because they will be fired if they report. They have a point system in the background in the firms, wherever the company they work for. I had one and um, the, it's just amazing. He drives a truck with the wastewater. Then he goes where he normally disposes it and then they get measured and then his, his body tells him, oh, you're too radioactive. You have to go to the other side. And I said, do you wear a meter where you can measure? Do you have any vest on any con? No, no, I have nothing, right? And I said, but you expose yourself all the time driving this radioactive material through the world. And then if it's really highly radioactive, it gets struck to uranium mine in Saskatchewan. So, but people have no perception. They think they're rolling up their window will protect them from radioactivity. But even if you explain to them, please make a complaint, nothing will happen because they will not even anonymous number from workers' comp say anything. And I think workers' comp must be aware of some things and uh, they yeah. are penalized by uh, reporting, which is workers, really unfortunate. Workers' compensation, so everybody knows this, Workers' compensation is funded 100% by fees from employers. Mm -hmm. There's no employee or public money in the, in the vaults of WorkSafe BC and other workers' compensation systems around the country. They are funded by employers and their perspective is enormously shaped by their, their funding source. You know, he who pays the piper calls the tune. And in this case, the piper is one single piper, the entire employer community. It doesn't mean they sometimes <laughs> do something good, but it's not, it's the exception rather than rule. If it's if a dispute between an employee's position, like I think I was exposed to radiation on the job, and the employer does not really want that kind of material published, then WorkSafe BC will tend. They're not, I don't even know if they're conscious about it, but I actually think they are, but they will not follow it up. I, I can give you examples that relate over the years, but I don't need to take all the time. I'm just telling you, don't expect miracles from workers' compensation schemes because they're designed to stop employers being sued. If you get so, a workers' compensation team. That's I feel like, oh yeah, thank you. I feel like our discussion is kind of veering a little bit off like the fracking and natural gas discussion, but it is very, it is very relevant, certainly what we're talking about. Um, reasons why people aren't reporting, reasons why employees and physicians aren't reporting. Um, so just, I know we're nearing the end of our uh, discussion here. I just wanted to put in the chat again, um, the different links in case people didn't catch them at the beginning. If you're inspired by what we've talked about today um, to sign up to lead an MLA meeting, um, please click on that first link. We'll be sending in emails later also to everyone with these links and with, appropriate, uh, with the appropriate um, information. The second link is the toolkit that you can check out with links to you know, both our literature and also how to set up your meeting. And the last one is the briefing note that we'd like you to leave behind um, with your MLA. So does anyone have any kind of final questions before we close out and, and hope that we hear from you, hope, uh, hope that we see your names on, on the sign up list? All right, well, thank you everyone so much. Um, thank you to Ulrika and um, Dr. Meyer for coming, Dr. Bell for your words of wisdom as always, Anjali who's not here right now, um, but we'll, you know, we'll send her our thanks. And yeah, all of you for, for your interest and for supporting our campaign. And we hope that we see again your names um, on our sign up list and 
and uh, that we hear back from you about the meetings that you've had from MLAs. Don't, don't, uh, don't hesitate to reach out if you want some support or further information about anything that we've talked about tonight. All right, thank you everyone and have a great night. Thank you, Melissa. Thank Bye. you everyone. Bye.